Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon, and as you know, I'm your host and your guide, and our job is to get you off the brink. So I try to find people who are going to give you a fresh perspective, see things through a clear lens. Let's just step back and take a moment, be a little anthropological, and begin to understand that you really don't know what's happening until you pause and think about it differently. And as you know, in my books, I help you see things through the eyes of my clients who all got stuck or stalled because their stories were so great that they couldn't see all the things that were going on around them. And that's why a little anthropology can help you change and grow and your companies get unstuck and soar. So today, Jillian Ted is with me. Let me tell you about why she's so special and why you're going to enjoy watching her or listening to her and listen carefully to the stories she has to tell. Jillian serves as a chair of the editorial board and editor at large in the US of the Financial Times. Forgive me for reading this, but it's very important that you hear it. She writes weekly columns covering a range of economic, financial, political, and social issues. She's also the co-founder of Financial Times Moral Money, a twice weekly newsletter that tracks the ESG revolution in business and finance, which has since grown to be a staple FT product. In 2020, Moral Money was the SABEW best newsletter. But I'll tell you, it's a great newsletter. Previously, Jillian was the Financial Times US managing editor, and she's also served as assistant editor for the Financial Times markets coverage and a lot of other things of great importance. I love to read the Financial Times, and I bet you will as well. She's the author of The Silo Effect, which looks at the global economy and financial system through the lens of cultural anthropology. And she's authored Fool's Gold, How Unrestrained Greed Corrupted a Dream, Shattered Global Markets, and Unleashed a Catastrophe, a 2009 New York Times bestseller and financial book of the year at the inaugural Spears Book Awards. I must tell you, she has written really good books, but I brought her today because she has a new book out called Anthrovision. And as you might imagine, it touched me and my heart and I read right through it, I couldn't stop because it was all about how what she's calling AI, not artificial intelligence, but anthropological insights or intelligence and a whole new perspective. And what I would like you to understand is how a little anthropology can in fact help you and your business see things through a, a fresh lens and why it's so important. Jillian, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for interviewing me. And it sounds like we know not only have a lot in common but a lot to learn from each other well, i'm interested in, in your own career and your own story because it sounds fascinating well i have enjoyed reading about yours but i'd like you to tell the listener or the audience about who is jillian because you've had a great journey that's taken you in many places and as an anthropologist as i read it i smiled just a little aside i took my daughters when they were four and five to greece to study greek women and i know you'd appreciate this i learned a whole lot about the greek women through my children I'm not sure what my children learned, but they still love me. And so that's all that mattered. Tell us about yourself. Who are you and what's your journey? Heard, anyone who's heard my biography would think that I'm thoroughly weird. <laughs> and that, to be honest, has been the reaction of many business leaders, political leaders, economists, grown-ups who pretend to run the world when they hear about my background. Because most people who work in high finance or business assume that if you're going to be a journalist writing about them, you should have a PhD in economics or an MBA or some kind of training quantitative um, intellectual pursuits. And my background is actually in cultural anthropology. Um, I did a BA and then a PhD at Cambridge University in the UK. And what anthropology really is about is about looking at human cultures and systems and what makes people and societies tick, not just in terms of the obvious things that we recognize, but most importantly, all the things that we tend to ignore around us all the time. I can say that just like psychologists look at our hidden biases in our brain, anthropologists look at our hidden biases and patterns and assumptions in society. So in my case, I went into anthropology because I was fascinated by the rest of the world. Um, I've always loved to explore and travel. And as a child, I dreamed of going to wacky, weird places or places that seem weird to me, um, a bit like an Indiana Jones, if you like, of the intellectual world. And cultural anthropology very much came out of that impetus in Victorian England, the idea that people would go off to other cultures to find the essence of what it meant to be human. Um, and, you know, a lot of what anthropologists did in the 20th century was indeed to go and travel. 
that's changed a lot in the 21st century, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But I went off, in my case, to a place called Soviet Tajikistan in 1989, and I spent about a year and a half of my life up in the high mountains in Tajikistan, um, living with a group of wonderful villagers. Um, I imagine most people listening have got no idea where Tajikistan is on the map or what it's like there. But basically, if you imagine the scenes you might have seen of Afghanistan on the news and take out the black veils and put in very brightly colored clothes, um, then you roughly have the idea of what my the village I was living in was like. It was in the high, high mountains of the Hindu Kush. And I was studying Tajik wedding rituals there. But I wasn't just studying the Tajik wedding rituals. I was looking at these rituals and symbols and ceremonies and all the economic exchanges associated with weddings as a key to try and understand how the Soviet Tajiks reconciled their identities of being Islamic and communism at the same time. Now, after I did my PhD, I then left Tajikistan. I actually became a journalist, originally a war reporter, and then I joined the FT and became an economics correspondent. And for the first few years, it felt as if all my training in cultural studies was completely irrelevant. But it's funny how life works, mm -hmm. because a few years after I started writing about finance, I suddenly realized that actually human beings are humans wherever they are. Yes. And in just the same way that I once studied Tajik wedding rituals in the Hindu Kush and looked at how they use symbols and ceremonies to express ideas about their world, so too investment bankers, to take one example, get together for gigantic ritualistic ceremonies called investment banking conferences, where they have all kinds of rituals like PowerPoints and bar meetings and golf tours. And those rituals and ceremonies and symbols um, also create social networks and express all kinds of assumptions, which could and should be studied through an anthropologist lens. So the latter part of my career has been all about trying to use this anthropological vision and apply it to the world of business and finance and economics. And frankly, I think it's something that anybody can, could benefit from, particularly now, given that COVID has ripped up our normal lives, tossed us all into culture shock, and meant that we can all benefit by thinking about what makes us really tick. When you think about that, you, in your book, I'll, I'll play out some of the stories in there. Um, you, you, you provided us with a broad range of fascinating illustrations of the application of anthropology to different situations, whether it was to a child care center that wasn't doing well, or to Mars getting into pet care, or to the economic crisis of 2008, or to what happened with Cambridge Analytics. Give us some illustrations, some case studies that are some of your favorites. The reason I ask is that as you were describing that, I could imagine being in the highlands of, of Russia. Um, I took my kids to see what it was like to be a woman in Greece, and I studied the Greek immigrants and their return migration. But if you haven't done that, there's no way you know what it's like. And when you do it in modern society, in our businesses, people say, well, what do you really do? I say, well, I hang out a lot. And I listen a lot and I'm looking for all the gaps that are on the sides of what people assume to be true. The only truth is there's no truth, I tell people. And then they get really frustrated because it's all an illusion that we're living. So some illustrations, some great stories that you enjoy sharing about mm, the ones that really make a difference. Well, one of the problems with anthropology and trying to communicate it in a corporate setting is that, um, you know, the corporate world likes to see things in shades of black and white and things on PowerPoints. And anthropologists say, well, actually life is gray and subtle and often contradictory. And the reality it is, and that's really the only way to understand situations, but it's not always easy to boil down into a single um, chart. But for me, one of the most important moments in my own career was when I realized that actually the same tools I looked um, at Tajik weddings with in terms of analyzing the symbols could and should be applied to investment banking conferences. And I went down to the Mediterranean in 2005 to an event called the European Securitization Forum and looked at those rituals as if I was studying them like an anthropologist, which showed me um, that the bankers that were engaged in that securitization business back in 2005 
had all kinds of assumptions that they were barely aware of themselves, but which were distorting their vision of finance quite significantly and laying the seeds for the subsequent 2008 financial crisis. So when I looked at the bankers at play in their conference, I could see that they were a tribe set apart with a strong sense of their own identity. Um, and like any social group that had a tight network that was both being reflected and reproduced in the banking conference, um, they had a creation mythology. You know, every group has a creation mythology. Their creation mythology was that perfectly liquid markets, so-called liqu liquefaction of financial markets was the ultimate perfect goal, the holy grail. Um, and they were so addicted to this idea of perfect free markets, so they kind of failed to see all the contradictions in their creation mythology, like the fact that although they were creating these innovations supposedly to make markets more innovative and more safe and more prone to perfect trading, most of these new products were so complex they weren't being traded at all. And they weren't even able to value them with free market prices because they weren't <laughs> in free market prices. They had to use models. Um, the tools they were using to disperse risk were actually introducing new risks risk. into the system because they were too complex for people to know where the risks had gone. And they said that these tools were being done entirely to help people, but there were no faces in their PowerPoints. It was all Greek letters. And that indicated, you know, it wasn't just an accident that there were no faces in their PowerPoints. It reflected a mentality that the end user had been kind of screened out of the mm -hmm. way they saw finance. And you can say, well, that's kind of a pity, but actually it had a really practical implication because yes. what it meant was that the people creating these financial products were so caught up with the creation process, they couldn't actually see how the products were being used on the ground at the end of the financial chain. Um, there's a wonderful scene in the movie, The Big Short, where a hedge fund trader goes and meets a pole dancer in Florida. And they <laughs> it's a great, go, great scene. <laughs> Please. Yeah, yeah the, finance, the hedge fund guy goes, you know, holy crap, these people are doing this with subprime mortgages. And it was a real shock. And the thing was that was shocking was not the fact that subprime mortgages were being used and abused on the ground. It was the fact that so few financiers could see what the end result was because they were so detached. So I came back from my conference having spotted all this in terms of how the bankers were conducting their rituals. And it's one thing that led me to later warn that there was going to be a financial crisis. And I kept issuing those warnings over and over again. So that's one example where you can use anthropology tools to look at how a social group is blinkered and has blind spots they don't see, which can be dangerous. But in my book, I talk about ways that consumer industry groups can use anthropology to try and un understand consumers, um, to try and understand what really drives fashions and trends, to try and also I talk about how businesses can use anthropology to see what's going wrong in their companies. General Motors did that very effectively several times. Um, and you can also use anthropology to understand how office, offices really work or how they don't work. So almost any sphere of life where people are operating can benefit from some anthropology. Often, I'll take a client with me out to their clients. So let's go spend a day in the life of your client. So I'm going to teach you a little anthropology. Let's go watch and see what's going on. You sell them solutions that you think are perfect. Let's watch how they're actually using them. Because to your point, if I went out and looked and came back, they would delete me. You didn't hear it right. You didn't see it right. So we go with them. And the two of us watch in the same factory exactly how it's being used, a sensor that's actually measuring the color of something or some technology that's being applied. And we go out and we write down everything we saw. And the two of us were in two different places at the same time. We were each seeing completely different things. The conversation that follows is fascinating to me because they 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 are still trying to figure out what it was I was looking at and listening to, to your point of this is about listening and seeing and what they were listening to and why they were trying to fit it into their box, like your wonderful economists were trying to fit it into their illusion of a reality. 
and what the reality actually was. And I, 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 my claim is mine isn't a better reality, but I'm looking for the gaps for you and you're looking to fit it into your box, which may no longer be the right box anymore. And that's so important now coming out of the pandemic is what used to be the way we did things isn't any longer the way we're doing it. And so people are hiring, hiring us to figure out what do we do now? What's happening out there? Come, come watch with us. So as you were putting together your, your book, I have a hunch each of the stories touched you in some of the same ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the power of anthropology in many ways, I would argue, is essentially um, what you're doing is um, trying to engage in a three-part journey. And mm. you know, the way I put it. Um, that basically you are trying to simultaneously um, trying to immerse yourself into the minds and lives of others so that you can understand them better. You're trying to, um, well, not just immerse yourself in the minds and lives of others, but really try and see the world through their eyes in a kind of humble, open-minded way and to collide with the unexpected. You're trying to um, then use that knowledge to look back at yourself mm -hmm. because you know, there's this wonderful Chinese proverb that a fish can't see water. Mm -hmm. None of us can see the assumptions that shape us unless we periodically jump out of our fish bowl, go swim with other fish and talk to other fish and then look back, back at ourselves. It gives us a clarity of vision. And then you use that inside and outside of perspective, um, the experience of being a stranger in your own land to not just look at the parts of the world that you talk about, the visible parts, but also the parts of the world that you don't talk about. Um, all the assumptions that you ignore because they seem boring or geeky or dull or taboo or obvious. And that sort of three-part journey can be really powerful. Um, and to cite a small example, you know, General Motors brought in an anthropologist, Elizabeth Bridey, to look at why some of its meetings were going so badly wrong, but all, rather why some of its merger initiatives were going so badly wrong. And there was an attempt in the late part of the latter part of the 20th century to create a sort of joint car between German and American engineers. It didn't work. <laughs> it's a and, great story. <laughs> Please continue. Time, yeah, they, they tried and tried for about two years to create a joint small car by bringing these teams of engineers together. And at the time, they assumed it was because of linguistic differences. And there was a tendency to think, oh, those Germans don't understand the Americans and the Americans don't understand the Germans, because that was the obvious you know, difference and distinction that was in everyone's faces. But some anthropologists observed the group and realized that actually it wasn't a straight story of German versus American clash. There was this bigger clash between different teams of Americans between Tennessee and Detroit um, because they all had very different cultures in their factories. And the really interesting thing was they kept calling meetings to try and resolve the problems without realizing that they all had all three different groups had different ideas about what a meeting was and what the whole point of it was. And the Germans thought it was basically to rubber stamp a decision that had already been taken and that it was supposed to be very hierarchical and that a meeting didn't really count as work because work was what you did elsewhere. The, um, the Tennessee group from memory thought that the meetings were there to kind of brainstorm and you had to have some kind of collaborative consensus based system and they thought meetings were work. And the Detroit group had another idea all over again. So all of the people coming into that meeting with different expectations, and because they weren't actually talking to each other um, you know, in advance, and they weren't looking at the story behind the story, which is basically what were their different cultures and what were their expectations of meetings, they kept wrongly describing it as a German-American thing, and it wasn't. So that pattern's played out over and over again in offices. And it's really important to think about that now for two reasons. Firstly, that most businesses right now are in the grips of radical tech transformation as automation and digitization takes off. And that's creating a whole different bunch of culture clashes because the way that say, a group of techies in San Francisco are trained to think or think about meetings is not the same as say, a group of metal bashers in Detroit. But secondly, um, COVID and the pandemic and lockdown has challenged all of our ideas about how mm -hmm. offices and work and meetings should happen. And we haven't been together in groups to kind of learn from each other and thrash it out. We've all been scattered and isolated. So within every company, the longer that COVID and lockdown has gone on for, the more you've created all these little micro subcultures 
who may be totally talking past each other all the time. And often exasperated senior managers, you know, who are middle-aged go, oh, these millennials, they're so weird. <laughs> but maybe it's not about age gap or about different generational cohorts. Maybe it's just the fact that different subcultures are growing up inside companies as we're scattered. And as we return, hopefully to the office, different cultural patterns will develop all over again. And we need to think about it. You are new. Well, you're not Malinowski and you're not going off like Margaret Mead to a small island. To some degree, that's just what's happened during this pandemic. Islands have emerged. And as we're watching them, for example, I have a wonderful client for, I'm going in my fifth year with them, all in transformation. And they used to give remote work as a benefit to their, their partners and their employees. Pandemic hit and everyone went remote, all 70 employees. Now they can't get them back into the office. <laughs> and they said, well, what was valued before as a benefit is now a penalty. And how do you take the same thing, remote work, one minute it's wonderful and one minute it's awful. What are the values that are coming? And the partners are lonely. And the reason they want them back together is for human companionship. And what's so interesting for me is to watch the dynamics going on because they don't find a way to articulate what really matters here. It isn't about having them come back in the office. It's that I miss them. <laughs> and that's not a bad, and people decide with feelings, not with yes. heart. So you, you can come back out with them with the logic of it, and they come back with the logic too. Well, I don't have to commute for an hour plus. I can get so much work done. You know, why do I have to be there to have lunch together? We're not gonna do that. I mean, it's so interesting to watch the head and the hearts here uh, at odds with each other in this island that, I'm not quite sure it was perfect before, and I'm not quite sure it's so bad right now, but nobody's quite sure what we should do to build coming out of it. And I have a hunch this is um, um, the proliferation of islands that all of us are watching happen across the country and across different industries. It's really interesting to, as an anthropologist, to step back and just observe and laugh a little and, and cry a little bit too. Because Absolutely. And I guess the point that you know very well that you've seen in your own kind of work which is so important is the important is that we need to talk not just about what people are obviously talking about all the time that's in your face, but also we need to always ask ourselves in any context, whether we're in an office or any other setting, what are we not talking about? What are we missing? What is the story behind the story? What's the context? And one of the ways I try and illustrate that point is through an issue that isn't to do with work, but practically everyone who's middle-aged with teenage kids is grappling with was why are teenagers so addicted to their cell phones mm -hmm. and if you ask people that question they go oh it's because of cell phone technology or it's because of those wretched teenagers or it's because you know evil tech companies are busy designing algorithms which are addictive you know and certainly that's true to some degree but the reality is that you can't understand teenage cell phone usage without stepping back and looking at what people don't talk about which is how teenagers move in the real physical world. And if you go back 100 years, teenagers had a lot of opportunities to physically roam and to meet their friends on the streets. You know, they might, even 50 years ago, they went to the shopping mall, they cycled to school, they would hang out with their friends, you know, on the fields without parents watching every move. Um, you fast forward to the 21st century, and even before lockdown, you had a whole generation of middle-class American teenagers, particularly in suburbs, who essentially are overscheduled, driven everywhere by their parents, constantly being monitored. And then you go into pandemic and suddenly this sense of physical constraint is even more extreme. So is it any surprise that you have a generation of people who think that the only place as a teenager that you can test boundaries, congregate spontaneously, explore the world without parents watching is online in cyberspace? Yes. So you can't talk about cyberspace experience without looking at the physical world. That's the social silence, to use a word that anthropologists sometimes use. And that model or metaphor applies over and over again to almost any aspect of modern life. But you said something very profound and well worth emphasizing. Um, the times make the man or the man make the times. Here we have you know, a transformation of trust, of safety, when I was a kid growing up, we would go outside and play stickball on the street. I'd get on my bike and ride to the mall to go shopping. Nobody, my mother worked, 
She was a professional. We just, we lived. As my kids grew up, you began to realize how much more structured their lives were without thinking about the implications of it. I don't think we spend our time saying that's good or that's not good. We sort of flow with what society is doing. And then you have all of the after effect of uh, transformation. I've had several universities who are frustrated because they couldn't get their Gen Ys, now they're Gen Zs, to come in and play athletics. They spent their days on video games and they were much happier playing a video game and not coming in to go play baseball or basketball or watch them. And, and the socializing was more challenging. I actually had a, a grown up client, a professional, who spent his weekends playing games and not without, and his whole friendship network were there. And, and as, a, as an observer, I said, oh, this is really, to your point, a transformation of our society without much intentionality here. If, you know, he was caught and, and the world he was in, he never met any of the folks that he played with, which by itself was sort of an interesting and new and bizarre society in which we're in. You know, as you're thinking about what's coming next, I don't know when the pandemic is really going to end or we're going to live in a COVID world for a while. Are you, are you beginning, people said we're a futurist and a podcast. I always like to ask, what are the signs you're seeing? What do you hear coming through? I have a hunch you're picking up little signals already that you're curious about, because I know I am. What do you see? Well, I think that people have been forced to re-examine um, how they're living. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating was the late 20th century was a time when people had quite rigid boundaries between home and work yep. in many professional contexts. Not always, but most Western professionals thought that the office was a place you worked. You might bring work back to home, but that was separate. That you had a work time and then a home time. You had your office colleagues, your friends, your family. They all sat in different buckets. And we took that for granted. The reality is that actually, you know, that pattern of the 20th century is an absolute aberration by most of human history um, and even by many parts of the world today. And what COVID has done is tossed most of us back into a state of being something like, you know, a peasant farmer where your house is your locus of work and your family is mixed up with your colleagues and everything else. And we may not like it, but it certainly challenged our boundaries. And I don't think it will be that easy for people to recreate those boundaries in such a rigid way going forward. Um, a second change that's happened, which is not so ben beneficial, is because we've been locked down in our own groups. I think many people have become myopic. You know, we've been basically been locked down with people just like us, our mm -hmm. pod, our friends. And people thought initially that when we went online, we would somehow break down our tribalism. Quite the reverse has happened because yes. the key thing to understand about the internet is that it allows us to customize our identities and experiences in a way that's never been possible before. Mm -hmm. And I think it's changed our vision of how we as individuals relate to society. You know, most societies in human history have seen the individual as a derivative of society. You know, we are a cog that fits into a machine mm -hmm. with identities that are pre-assigned. Um, and then came the, you know, enlightenment in Europe and this idea that we the center, we are the center of our society, um, the me generation, I think therefore I am, society is a derivative of me. The 21st century with digital tools has given us the capability to basically customize our world as we want it. Yes. You know, we customize our coffee choices, our media sources, our friendship groups, our identities online. You know, we customize our music tastes. You know, today's generation doesn't want to have a vinyl record which has been pre-assembled by someone else we want our own pick and mix music to listen to when we want exactly yeah. what we want how we want and that's really a shift that's been exacerbated by pandemic because we've been so reliant on cyberspace and it's made us even more tribal i think in a very bad way another shift that's happened is that um, people's sense of the future being a predictable rigid path that goes in one direction i think has been shaken by the pandemic yeah. um late 20th century was a time where most westerners had lived a pretty stable life pretty predictable mm -hmm. life no longer and it was also a world where people thought okay so i have business economics in one bucket and sort of do-gooding environment social issues are in another and i think again that's breaking down 
And you can see that in the corporate world where essentially companies are realizing that environmental, social and governance issues aren't just about activism. They're about risk management, about making sure that you don't suffer reputational risks or the loss of assets that lose value if the regulatory climate changes and you don't alienate your customers and your employees. Um, so people are no longer seeing business in just such a rigid tunnel vision way. It's more about lateral vision. Um, and that's very, very important. And last but not least, I'd say that um, another shift has been in terms of how imagine, say, cryptocurrencies and finance. Um, in some ways, the move into cryptocurrencies, the move into meme stocks is also part of this pick and mix culture. Um, patterns of trust are changing. Um, you know, as an anthropologist, we used to say there was either vertical trust, so a horizontal trust where people trusted each other in peer to peer groups, and that provided the social group glue to keep groups together, or you had a vertical trust, which was trust in institutions and leaders on a large scale. And it was presumed that when you had big groups, you couldn't have horizontal trust. Well, digital platforms have enabled something called distributed trust to explode. Suddenly, huge groups of people can do things on the basis of trusting each other via digital tools. That's how, say, Airbnb operates. Um, it's also how most cryptocurrencies operate. You trust okay. the crowd through a digital platform, but not through an organizational hierarchy. And that's, again, changing people's attitude towards money and value and exchanges in a fascinating way. And, and if we write about this in about five years, um, we will have captured a major catalytic moment transforming society. If you listen to the multipliers of what we've just described, when I work with my own CEOs, mostly mid-market sized clients, um, they are becoming far more stuck, stalled, and immobilized than they've ever experienced in the past. They don't know what to do. And what's so fascinating to me is that they really don't know what to do, and they're not willing to go out of their, talk about their corner office, out of their comfort zone to begin to see. And so they're really struggling with whether or not their businesses are going to survive. And there's no reason why they can't survive, they just have to change. And all of a sudden, that entrepreneurial spirit that got them there is stalled, and, and, and the certainty you spoke about I'm not sure that was true or an illusion that humans prefer certainty versus being fragile and agile. Um, but in fact, it's really raising up those people who can see opportunity in being agile and, and, and willing to change. The brain hates me when I go into a company to say, we're going to change. And immediately all that cortisol gets produced and they go, oh, please get out of here. Um, but in fact, I do think we're becoming uh, there's going to be a training ground now for the agility that's needed for the next phase because as we come out of this it's not going to be certain either and nobody can really plan the way they might have thought and i don't think that you should plan anything i think you should try to be nimble agile adaptive and talk to people you mm. speak about the silence it's a great time to start listening just talk to people and and you don't have to do it in person if you don't want to but you can try but I do think it's a time to listen to each other and not decide anything. Just pull it in and, and just be an anthropologist. Just listen to the conversations. Judith Glazer had a wonderful book on conversational intelligence that she starts by saying all of society are conversations. And mm -hmm. I truly think that's a simple way of saying, yep, just listen to each other, what the conversations are, hang out and begin to think about Ooh, what's really going on in those conversations. It's a little like that pick, uh, that that scene when they go down and they say, that's who's doing the subprime mortgages. What are we missing? Yeah. You have some great wrap up five big things in AnthroVision. You wanted to share them with our audience? I can help you. <laughs> well, <laughs> the two of us were I laughing think... before, but they were profound. I, I guess I'm pushing people, hmm, bring a little anthropology into your life. It's important. What are those five yeah. things? Absolutely. Well, having said, you can't boil, boil anthropology down to a PowerPoint. Here's my PowerPoint <laughs> effort. Lesson one, recognize that we're all creatures of our own environment in a cultural sense. We're all fundamentally shaped by a set of assumptions that we inherit from our surroundings that we never usually think about. Yep. Um, and they matter. Lesson two is recognize that just because we are shaped by a set of assumptions, that doesn't mean they're universal. Um, it sounds very obvious, but the reality is that it's human nature to assume 
that the way that we live and operate and function is not just inevitable, but natural and proper, and that everyone else should kind of live like us. And guess what? There is a multitude of different ways to live and think. And if you think that yours is the only right way, you're going to suffer badly in business. Um, lesson three coming out of this is take time to immerse yourself periodically in the minds and lives of people who seem different from you. Mm -hmm. In my case, I went to Tajikistan, which for someone having grown up in England, it was very, very different indeed. But you don't have to go to the other side of the world or the Hindu Kush. Um, just go talk to someone down the end of your road who lives in a different world. Go mm -hmm. talk to someone in a different department. Um, go take a different route to work. Go swap a day with someone in a different profession. And if you can't do it physically because of the pandemic, get online and basically explore another tribe online and their yep. mentality. I mean, just change the people you follow on Twitter, say, for a week, and you'll see a complete different perspective on life. And then lesson five, four, use the experience of immersing yourself in the minds of others to become a stranger in your own land and to look back mm -hmm. at yourself with fresh eyes and see what a stranger would consider to be weird or shocking um, or impressive about how you live and your assumptions. And lesson five, think about what you're not thinking about. Mm -hmm. What are the parts of your life that you're ignoring, the social silences? Um, often thinking about the rituals that you use in your everyday life, the symbols, um, the patterns that you use to organize your space um, and your family groups or your time, those can often be very revealing if you step back and look at them with an insider outsider's eyes. You know, why would you consider it to be odd to keep your hairbrush in the fridge? Why does that make people laugh? You know, I mean, why not? You know? And then you well, that's right. What are you missing there? Well, what is it, what are your ideas about different body parts and about your mouth versus your hair? Or, you know, all these inbuilt assumptions which um, you take for granted, but are often very revealing. There's nothing wrong with the patterns we inherit from our surroundings, unless we remain prisoners of them and cannot imagine alternatives. And right now, as we come out of the pandemic, try to reimagine the world and recover and rebuild. It really is time to have an open mind, particularly after a pandemic that's kept us locked down mentally and physically and in danger of being captured by tribalism. What a beautiful ending, Jillian. Thank you so much. I've had such fun. It's fun to wander with you. Um, um, any last thoughts? How can they reach you and how can they buy your book? Because I think all well, your books are great, but Anthropovision is great. Well, first of all, <laughs> let me say what a great joy it's been to do this with you. And I greatly salute what you've done in your own career, which is fascinating. Um, I write for the Financial Times twice a week with columns. Um, I also oversee a platform called Moral Money, which is the ESG sustainability platform at the FT, which is a newsletter that goes out three times a week. Um, and my new book, Anthrovision, is out on sale. I should say, last but not least, um, as another sign of culture, if you're listening to this in America, you can find my book, Anthrovision, with a bright red jacket cover and a picture of me on the back wearing a bright red top looking like a Fox TV babe. <laughs> <laughs> because red sells in America. If you pick up my book in the UK or any part of the former, you know, um, Commonwealth, as they say, you'll find my book is sold with a nice white understated cover with a picture of me on the back wearing a blue shirt on a stoop clutching a cup of coffee because the British publishers thought that a picture of me looking like a Fox TV babe was too scary for the British market. <laughs> And therein, about. Lies, and therein <laughs> lies a story about why culture matters. <laughs> and you hope they're right. <laughs> well, I think that um, for the listener and our audience, whether you're watching this or listening to us, it's been truly a special time to share um, the essence of On the Brink with Andy Simon, our podcast, his our book. But my job is to help you get off the brink. And if you can see, feel, and think through a fresh lens, there are so much going on today that's going to expand in a positive way the possibilities that are before you. It's the art of possibilities now. And rather than trying to go back, people say, I can't wait till the old comes back. It's not coming back because I don't even know what the old was, and you don't either. 
but you also know that the new is giving you opportunities that are tremendous. Think about them in a positive way, and you'll see them turning lemons into lemonade or limes into margaritas, as somebody said to me recently. It's a great time. Jillian, thank you for joining me today. And for our listeners, don't forget, here's what I'd like you to do. I get from across the globe emails at info at andysimon.com. You send me your ideas. You send me people who you want me to interview. Send them. And give me some ideas about topics that would be cool for you. I actually am doing a leadership academy. And one of the gentlemen there, a physician, said, you know, my sons are listening to your podcast. And I laughed and I said, how old are they? Ten, eight and 10. I said, so that's my target audience <laughs> and I'll keep talking to them. But they should listen hard because I think they and you will really benefit from understanding how a little anthropology can help you and your business grow. Bye-bye now. Stay well. Bye-bye.